Well, welcome to our study in Nehemiah. You will recall from our discussion with Ezra that Nehemiah and Ezra, they're going to be contemporaries, and they're going to be a part of this process of bringing the people of God from their prophes Jeremiah's prophesied uh, captivity, uh, bringing them back and restoring uh, the, the people of God and the place of God. These two men are going to be instrumental in the leadership of that. Now, Nehemiah's concern is ultimately for the welfare of Jerusalem and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he's going to take some pretty bold actions, as we'll see later on as we start to break open the book itself. He's going to take some pretty bold actions to start that process, to get it going. So the, in that respect, Nehemiah becomes a person, uh, not just of faith, but, a, but, of a, but of a faithful leader of the people of Israel, just as Ezra is. Uh, but Nehemiah, to me, just really has a, a special place in all of this discussion, mainly because of how he becomes uh, this leader, this governor, if you will, of, of Israel. And we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get into it. But ultimately, he's going to be granted permission, along with his countrymen, to basically go back home and begin the process of rebuilding the shattered wall of Jerusalem. Now, what he's going to find out in that process is that there's going to be two restorations that are taking effect. There's going to be the restoration of the city itself, the, the political and spiritual center of the people of God. But there's going to be a harder restoration, and that's going to be the people themselves. And Nehemiah and, and Ezra are instrumental in bringing the people back into a covenant relationship with God. So today as we break open this book and we take a look at this leader, Nehemiah, and his contemporary Ezra, I hope that you're encouraged to step out in faith as Nehemiah did, to step out in a way to lead God's people in a time and in a culture in which uh, we need more Nehemiahs. So with that all being said as way introduction, let's begin the process of uh, just looking at some major ideas from the book. Okay, you'll probably remember just from a, a historical standpoint what's going on here with uh, Israel. This is a period of time, a period of Jewish history in which the fall of Jerusalem has happened. Uh, and they've been carried off into Babylonian captivity. And really, it really marks the, the end of the biblical history, this story that we've been tracing uh, through the seed of Abraham up to this point. It's really kind of the end of that biblical history, if you allow me to use that term, and the beginning of this intertestamental period that's going to lead us ultimately to Christ. But you remember how this all started. The Jews were carried off into Babylonian captivity in 606 all the way through 536 B.C. Now, they'll move under Persian rule. Persia will begin to be their captors uh, in 536 to around 333 B.C. The biblical period from 536 to 423 marks this process of return of the people of God to Israel. The first return, as we looked at in Ezra 1 through 6, uh, Zerubbabel, who was a part of that, was done from 536 to 515. The, the temple is going to be completed uh, in this same section of Ezra 1 through 6 in 515. Then there's this blank page in Jewish history from 515 to 485. But Remember, we have in here as well, during this Persian time, the story of Esther. And we'll look at her more next week and how she contributes to this, uh, this opportunity, if you will, for the people of God to begin their process of rebuilding the temple and themselves. So ultimately, at the end of, of uh, Ezra 7 through 10, we begin to see the restoration under Ezra and Nehemiah. And then there's this non-biblical period uh, in which the Jews are under Greek rule. 
there uh, there'll be a period of time where they're under ind uh, or an independent people for from about four forty or one forty two up to about six sixty three BC. But then, as we get ready to enter the New Testament, the Jews are under Roman rule all the way up to seventy AD. And so that's kind of just a brief history, if you will, of what's going on uh, from the time of the end of this biblical history that we've been studying that's going to trail us uh, through this intertestamental period where Israel is heading back to Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple and reestablishing this covenant. Now, as we said, you remember that, that Jeremiah, he prophesied that this Babylonian exile would last 70 years. Uh, we have few details about the event of these 70 years, but we do know that it was prophesied by him. The book of Ezra picks up the story of the Jews at the end of this Babylonian exile and the beginning of the decree of Cyrus. And it is and it's these records of the first and second return under Zerubbabel and Ezra that we've already covered up to this point. But the book of Maya is going to tell us how Nehemiah gave up his job as a cupbearer to King Xerxes and the Persian king, and then becomes governor of Jerusalem. So when we look at these returns, once again, I just I, I want us to take a look at the, the return itself, the date that it's associated, leader, and uh, the specific portion of scripture that you could look at if you wanted to see more of that. And you'll see these, here they are uh, listed on your screen. You stage one with Zerubbabel, he rebuilds the temple in Ezra 1 through 6. Stage 2, or return to, is uh, Ezra, and it's a spiritual revival that we see in Ezra 7 through 10. Nehemiah, he'll be the third return, and he's going to rebuild the city walls, and that covers the whole book of Nehemiah. Ultimately, the theme as we began to look through uh, this particular book is the restoration of the Jews to their homeland. And I would add to that the restoration of the Jews to God. They're going to rebuild this temple. They're going to rebuild the, the political and geographical center of the people of God, but they're also going to rebuild the people of God themselves. They will reestablish this covenant that was given to them from God that's promised through the Abrahamic seed and is ultimately at the end of this book, pointing us to a period of time in which the Messiah is going to come. So with that also as our major ideas and themes, let's begin to uh, move into our next section of study. Now, as I always like to do, I'd like to, to establish some, some key elements to the book of Nehemiah. And some of this may be a little bit repetitive, but as you go through and read this book, here are some key things that are going to pop out to you or that I would encourage you just to kind of proverbially hang your hat on as key indicators of what this book is specifically focused on. Uh, the first key thing I'd like for us to take a look at is, uh, is a key word in the book of Nehemiah. And that word has to be Jerusalem walls. Now, while Ezra is dealing with the religious restoration of the, the people themselves, as we've already said, Nehemiah is primarily concerned with the political and geographical restoration of Israel, that being the Jerusalem wall. You cannot have a city, a, a city of prominence and, 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 and protection without these city walls in their day. And so that's why the big focus there for Nehemiah is while Ezra's focusing on the people, there has to be this means in which the people are protected. So Nehemiah begins the process of rebuilding these walls. And the first seven chapters are devoted to this in the book of Nehemiah. Without the walls, Jerusalem could hardly be considered a city at all. And Nehemiah also establishes the civil authority within the city itself. So Ezra and Nehemiah are working together to do this process of building the people spiritually, morally, and restoring this uh, geographical uh, position of Israel within, uh, the, the, within their uh, uh, area of space, of, of geographics. Now, the second thing I'd like for us to take a look at is uh, a key chapter 
in the book of Nehemiah, and that would be Nehemiah chapter 9. The key to the Old Testament is the covenant. It is, it's, it's its theme, it's its unifying factor for the people of God and God himself. It's, this, it's the establishment of this relationship between these people, between the people and their God. Israel's history can be divided according to a nation of obedience and our disobedience to God's covenantal conditions. And because of that, blessings and obedience, destruction and disobedience are kind of primary themes that we see happen uh, throughout the biblical history of Israel. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 9, records that upon the completion of the Jerusalem wall, the nation reaffirmed its loyalty to the covenant. And so therein is reestablishes uh, this covenant between these people and reestablishes the focus of this Abrahamic uh, covenant in which the Messiah is soon to come. Okay, I'm sorry for the cut there. The phone kept ringing here in the office, so I had to, to stop the recording and disconnect the phone. Uh, I need to remember that next time. Um, some key verses. Uh, first key verse I'd encourage to take a look at is Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 uh, and 16, and then also uh, Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. Uh, so, so here's the reading. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elu in 52 days. And it happened when all of our enemies heard of it, and all of the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that the work was done by our God. And that's Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16. And then 8, verse 8 says, So they read distinctively from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. So there's two things that are really happening in these key verses. Number one, the pressure from the outside, the people that surround uh, Israel, their, her, her enemies, if you will, see this astonishing feat that this wall is built in 52 days and they can't help but to give credit to Israel's God as the person that made this possible. But on the other side of it, there's this internal restoration that we see happening in this uh, 8 verse 8 in which there's this beginning of the understanding of what this covenant is all about and what their role is to be in it. All right, so let's, do, uh, let's take our time now to, to survey the book itself. Uh, not to be repetitive here, but just simply to uh, begin the process of surveying this book. We've said that Nehemiah and Ezra are contemporaries. They're working together. Ezra can be viewed as the priest who's bringing this spiritual revival back to Israel, while Nehemiah, on the other side of it, is a, is a governor. He's more of a political and physical leader who's in the process of restoring or, the, or re reconstruction of the city itself and also the moral reform of the people. These two combine to form this very effective team in the process of rebuilding Israel in this post-exilic uh, remnant. Malachi is the last Old Testament prophet who also ministers during this time to uh, provide additional moral and spiritual support uh, for these leaders and the people of Israel. The book of Maya, Nehemiah is going to take us from the, the end of the historical count of the Old Testament, about 400 years before the birth of Christ, and, and tell us the story of Israel's restoration. And so it's these two divisions that, uh, that are, there are two divisions that are going to make up the book itself. We're going to take a look first at uh, chapters 1 through 7, which can, uh, as you see on the chart here is the reconstruction of the wall. And then secondly, we'll take a look at the uh, restoration of the people. All right, so the first section of the reconstruction of the wall is going to be Nehemiah chapters 1 through 2. And if I had a favorite section in this book, 
it has to be this section just because of the the boldness and the courage that we see uh, exhibited by Nehemiah in this. You'll remember Nehemiah's position in the court of Xerxes, and that was that he was his cupbearer. So he was very, very close to the king, and the king had a lot of trust in this individual, uh, simply because his life weighed in the balance based off of the the, the cupbearer. The cupbearer would serve the purpose of drinking the king's wine before he did, to be sure that, uh, that it wasn't poisoned in any way or could hurt the king in any way. And so Nehemiah is not only close in proximity to the king, uh, Xerxes, but he's also close in proximity relationally with this king. And so with, with that relationship, um, there's also this dynamic of work in which he is a uh, slave. Uh, he's in captivity to this king. And so you've, you've got this weird dynamic taking place between the king and uh, and and Nehemiah himself, in which there's this huge amount of trust, this huge amount of proximity, but yet this recognition of of a status between the two, in which he's the king, and Nehemiah is the slave. But it doesn't hold Nehemiah back. And Nehemiah begins reflecting upon uh, the discovery that the the walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed, and then he begins to intercede with God, asking God, you know, what, what should I do about this? What, you know, I'm, I'm broken up about this. And then there's this beautiful dynamic in which Nehemiah is in the presence of Xerxes in chapter 2, where he begins to say that he was before the king. And in the, in the presence of the king, he had this disposition of being extremely sad. And the king will ask him, you know, why are you sad? He'll say in verse number two, why is your face sad since you were not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Then I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, my king, live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the palace of my father's tombs lies in waste and the gates are burned with fire? And then the king says, what do you request? And then here it is. So Nehemiah said, I prayed to God of heaven. And then he says to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And so the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. And so this process begins. This return of, of Nehemiah to Israel to begin this process. But it didn't happen simply by someone saying, let's go do it. And there was this process in which fear and faith collided with Nehemiah. And Nehemiah chose faith over the fear. And as a result of it, Israel is going to begin the process of rebuilding the temple and rebuilding their lives. And in many respects, we look to Nehemiah and say, without a Nehemiah, without an Ezra, would there have been any other leader in that time that could rise up to begin this process of restoration. We don't know that. But what we do know is that requirements of leadership, requirements of people of faith, is to recognize when we're in fear, to recognize that that, that is an appropriate response to danger, to feeling threatened. Because Nehemiah's, the king could have just taken his life right then and there if he didn't appreciate or didn't like what Nehemiah had to say. But Nehemiah recognized the importance of that city. He recognized the importance of what it stood for. He recognized that would in time even deep, more on a more deeper level begin to understand the purpose of the covenant and how God is going to rise up the Messiah through it. And so Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah steps out in that moment of fear takes a moment to beseech our Father, and then steps out in faith 
Godly leadership requires that. Godly leadership requires us to be willing to take those moments of fear, of, of frustration, of what it, all of this will be part of what we will see happen with Nehemiah, to take those moments, beseech our Father, and then trust that he will walk us through that fear or that frustration. So as a result, in chapter 3, we began to see the reconstruction of the wall. The wall is going to be built in a miraculous 52-day uh, period, but it's not going to be without opposition. As we look through this chapter all the way through uh, you know, mid part of chapter 6, we're going to see a huge amount of opposition that Israel's going to encounter. And here's just a list of what they face. They're going to face opposition through ridicule, through a threat of attack, the discouragement, even extortion, uh, slander, treachery, all of these moments in which Israel could be ultimately discouraged, but Nehemiah provides that leadership through his example and through his words in which Israel is able to accomplish this incredible feat of the reconstruction of the walls and that is ultimately completed in the latter part of chapter 6. And as a result of that, then they'll begin this process of organizing Jerusalem and the, restora uh, the uh, registration, pardon me, the registration of Jerusalem, uh, of, its, of its organization and, and how God intends for that city, how he intended for that city to function from a theocratical, the a theocratical pos uh, position. So, uh, that gets us through the first section, the reconstruction of the wall. Now let's take a look at the second section. All right, now in the second half, we're looking at the restoration of the people. The construction of the wall is followed by the consecration of the people. Ezra, the, the priest and leader of this spiritual renewal, reminisces of the reforms he led 13 years earlier in Ezra chapter 9 and verse 10. And then Ezra stands on this special wooden podium after the completion of the walls and gives the people this, this marathon reading of the, of, the, of the covenant of the book of law. And he translates it from Hebrew to Aramaic. And I think it's important to recognize why that happened, Scripture tells us, so that the people could understand. For during the time of captivity, uh, the people of God began speaking in Aramaic because of the captivity. And so Hebrew was not a familiar form of reading to, to most of them. And so that's the purpose of why it's read in Aramaic, so that they could just simply understand. Now, th their response is extraordinary. The response to this reading that they hear, they, they begin this, this weeping and confession, um, and they turn to obedience and, and all of this rejoicing. The Levites and priests learn, lead them in this great prayer that surveys God's past work of deliverance and loyalty and the, and, and how, and the role that the people of God are going to play in that. And he magnifies these, these godly, uh, God's attributes of holiness, justice, mercy, and love. And I, the, the, the review of those attributes alone I was watching a TV program the other day in which it was a comedy show in which they jokingly referred to the God of the Old Testament as being different than the God of the New Testament. And um, we, we may hear that a lot, and we may even encounter it a lot within religious circles, that there, there, there was these two different types of personalities that we see uh, in God. The, the characteristics and personality of the Old Testament, this wrathful, vengeful, um, thumb up on you oppression God. But then we also see this God of the New Testament that's loving and kind and merciful. Not, that's, not a, that's not an adequate picture. That's not a clear picture of who God is throughout the, all of Scripture. God's attributes, God's uh, desire is to be holy and to be just, to exercise mercy and love towards his creation, towards his people. And the covenant 
as it's renewed, that's the message that these people get, that this is a God who loves them and wants to be in relationship with them. And so what we see happen is this, is these lots are drawn to determine who's going to remain in Jerusalem and who will return to the cities of their inheritance. About one-tenth are required, Scripture tells us, to stay in Jerusalem. And the rest, uh, the rest go out to the land and they begin to resettle and it's made up of both priests and the people themselves. The walls of Jerusalem are dedicated to the Lord in this joyful ceremony, and they're dedicated to the Lord through this accompaniment of, of, of music and song. Unfortunately, this, this revival of Ezra is short-lived, and Nehemiah, who returned to Persia in 432 B.C., makes a second trip to Jerusalem about 425 B.C., to help in the reformation of the people. He cleanses the temple, he reinforces the Sabbath, and requires the people to put away their, their foreign wives. And as a result of this second cleansing, if you will, we are now at the end of the book of Nehemiah, and we have seen this process of restoration through these two men, of the restoration of the, the people of God and the restoration of the place of God. And as we begin to move forward, we're going to next week take a look at Esther and her role in all of this story as well. So thank you for your time. We pray, I pray uh, blessings upon you and that you enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you for joining me and we'll see you again next week for the book of Ezra. God bless.